Next on the Broadway show, a Broadway bombshell, Pamela Anderson is on the show to talk about making her Broadway debut in Chicago. Plus, To Kill a Mockingbird is coming soon to a city near you. We're chatting with the national tours, Atticus Finch, Richard Thomas. And he's the new king of the jungle. We're meeting the Lion King's new Simba, Brandon A. McCall. I'm Tamson Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. We're always excited to bring you another amazing episode of The Broadway Show. I'm Tamson Fidel. Thanks so much for joining us. She is an icon, the 90s personified, and even now the name on everybody's lips is definitely Pamela. Pamela Anderson making her Broadway debut as Roxy Hart in Chicago. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. I got a chance to sit with Broadway's newest leading lady who is hard at work for her run in the show, which starts April 12th. The announcement that you were going into Broadway's Chicago as Roxy Hart, not only rocked Chicago, it has rocked the world. People are so excited. <laughs> I hope, are you feeling the love? I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling, there's a lot of support. I'm really happy. I mean, it's rocked me too. Are you kidding? This is like a, it's like a crazy dream come true. I don't even think I dreamt this big. I I'm excited. This is a return to performing for you. Why is now the time? I have focus. You know, before my kids were young, you know, relationships, whatever, you know, always took my focus. I'm always trying to help other people, fix people's lives. And this is the thing. This is, this is for me, you know, and my kids are my cheerleaders. So I have such great, a great support system around me. And it's, that's what you need. I mean, this is a this is crazy. I mean, the dancing, the singing, the, the choreography, the, the, it's, it's iconic, the story and, and the people that have done it before me, the shoulders you're standing on, these powerful women that have done it before you, all my heroes, and I can't believe I'm doing it. You know, there's the dancing and there's the singing, there's yeah. the acting, but then you're part of this whole heartbeat. This heartbeat just keeps moving together and it's really, really interesting. I, I'm just eating it up. I'm, it's like a, I'm like a sponge. I just, just love it. and I. I, I just love it. I mean, I could do, I could rehearse all day and all night. My legs would take it. I love it. What does lovely Pamela Anderson have in common with Mary Murderous Roxy Hart? What are, you, what are you sort of clicking in with about this woman? I feel completely this parallel journey. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Just the power of media, the power of um, belief in yourself yeah. and how to make something out of nothing or something positive out of crazy. You know, she has a dream, which is so admirable. I love that, I love that. And and it's never too late. You have genuinely been the name on everybody's lips for <laughs> over 30 years. What are the tips to uh, longevity? Be yourself. You know, there's that famous expression, be yourself when everyone else is telling you what to do or what not to do. And I think it's difficult, especially in this day and age with all the social media and everything out there. I mean, you really, I like think the 90s were kind of like, trying to be, your, you, were, you were really trying hard to be original. Mm. And I think now kind of people are blending into each other a little bit, like they want to be like somebody else. When you know, all those good things that we need are your originality, your unique thoughts, your unique fashion choices, mm -hmm. every, your unique activism, anything, What unique thinkers. Not to follow the bewildered herd, just to make your own story. I like when people say, oh, don't do this. I'm just, just, it's okay, it's okay, I got this. Uh -huh. <laughs> do you like surprising people too? Well, I, I like surprising myself too, which I'm really doing right now. Just like throwing yourself off a cliff and see how you land. I mean, I really, I love this feeling. I'm scared out of my mind. I am, you know, soaking it all in. I'm tr working really hard and I love the physicality of it. And, you know, I'm even surprising myself every day. It's singing, my voice is getting stronger. And I'm like, oh, who is that? You know, I'm kind of, <laughs> wow. And it's, it's, it's all, you know, it's muscles. It's, it's, there's a science to it. There's, and, and to be able to have the people that really know what they're doing, tell me how to kind of hone those things. Or this is so exciting, so exciting. And also, who doesn't want to be on Broadway with showboys behind you? This is a little distracting. <laughs> I didn't want to have those feelings right now. <laughs> I am focused, and then you're like, oh, wow, geez. Even in the photo shoot, I was like, oh, yeah, what is it? <laughs> yeah, so it's a sexy show. What specifically is keeping you up at night? What, what is, is there anything like specific that makes you nervous about oh, this? Oh my God, I wake up, actually I woke up in the middle of the night the other day. I woke up, I did the monologue, went back to sleep. <laughs> it's like three in the morning, I woke up like, you wanna know something? You know, and then I went back to sleep. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's in there, it's just constantly percolating. It's fun. What's, what's it gonna be like as you're about to take the stage and in front of an audience at the Ambassador well, Theater? I don't know yet. <laughs> I will see what happens when I get there. But it's just that the, the theater is very intimate. The Ambassador Theater is very 
beautiful and I kind of walked around and I've been working on stage and you know we were rehearsing for a while and we've only had a few days on the stage so far so I was looking around going this is incredible this is really exciting just the energy in there and all the, all the people that have performed there you know there's, an, there's definitely an, a magical energy in the theater. After all these years, The Lion King continues to roar on Broadway, and Brandon A. McCall is the king of kings. He started the show on tour, and now he's Simba on Broadway. And that's why he's this week's Fresh Face. Hey, what's up? I'm Brandon McCall, and I play Simba in Disney's The Lion King on Broadway. Well, I started acting at the age of 12, and it was my mom's way of keeping me out of trouble. And so she took me to this audition. I got a call back, made it in, and I remember the first table read and the director saw me and this other guy that look alike and she actually wrote a part just for us. And I just remember every time we came out, the crowd would go crazy. I was like, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> In my high school, we did not have a, a drama department, but this theater troupe, I went back to every summer. So from the age of 12 to the age of 18, I was going back every summer. But I remember my uh, senior year in high school, I walked past my ninth grade history teacher, never forget it, she's a big part of my uh, journey. And she was asking, Mr. McCall, what do you plan on doing, you know, after high school? What are you going to take up in college? And I was like, well, you know, I want to be a pediatrician, so I'll major in biology. And she was like, great, because I didn't think that acting thing was going to work out for you. And I said, oh. So I walked away from her that day, changed my major to theater, and attended Alabama State University. That's where it became a career choice. This is my life. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to make my living. And I love what I do. My journey has been crazy with The Lion King, in a good way though. I started on the tour in 2018. I was in the ensemble, understudy Simba. In October 2019, I had the opportunity to actually be the principal Simba. Um, so from October 2019 until about February, March 2020, uh, I was Simba on the tour. And then of course, the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> but there was definitely a silver lining because now I'm here on Broadway. My daughter is obsessed with The Lion King. I remember when I was younger, I had the VHS. I played that thing all the time. That's probably how I learned how to work the VCR because I think my mom and sister were tired of me like requesting to watch this movie. She's the same way. Like she wants to watch The Lion King all the time. If she doesn't want to watch the animated version, she wants to watch the musical. And so like, you have to pull up my videos. If you pull up YouTube and pull up other people, she'd be like, eh, I wanna see my daddy. And I'm like, okay, girl, all right. <laughs> the moment of just being on Broadway, it, I don't think anything can match it, you know, especially being in The Lion King. But it means so much, especially to have my family, my wife and my two girls, to actually be able to see the show and for my two girls to be able to watch me and, and have that example of chasing a dream and actually accomplishing it. Family is, is a big deal, it's a big theme in the show, and um, it's a big theme of life. Oh, sometimes I get a good feeling, yeah. yeah. I get a feeling that I never, 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 never had before. You're the girl with the deaf family? Yeah. yeah. Coda is the Best Picture winner at this year's Academy Awards. Now a stage adaptation is in the works. The musical is being developed with the film's co-producers in partnership with the Tony-winning Deaf West Theater. Deaf West is known for blending sign language and spoken words in its stage productions. The movie Coda, by the way, is streaming on Apple TV+. There's still a whole lot more to talk about on this edition of The Broadway Show. Coming up, we'll talk to one of the stars of Mrs. Doubtfire, the musical, about why she's just got to dance. I'm Tamson Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. All Rise, Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird is coming soon to a city near you. The national tour headed by Richard Thomas in the role of Atticus Finch. Let's go ahead and send it back out to Paul Wontorek. So excited to see you in To Kill a Mockingbird. You're going to hit you. the road in this iconic character, Atticus Finch. That, yes. that name has a lot of weight to it, doesn't it? 
Yes, it does. He, Atticus, his shoes are large. He, he, he takes up a lot of space in our, in our uh, cultural history and is very, a very important character. He's one of those characters who seems to be a real person. Mm. Um, we think of him frequently not as, a, not as a character in a novel and then a film, but as actually a person. And uh, so it's going to be very exciting. Do you remember when this Harper Lee novel came out and the movie came out? You were a boy at the time, sure. and already in show business. Sure. Of course, I read it in school and, and was very moved and touched and frustrated and energized by it. Um, and then the film is just a wonderful, wonderful piece of film from that period uh, uh, with terrific performances. And so that, that became a part of my memory of it. You know, you think about it now and you put faces one does, one puts film faces to characters in novels and it all gets, it all gets a little bit mixed up. So. But sure, it was a real presence for me growing up. I mean, for so many Americans. You're a real man of the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, you've done so many amazing things on, on stage in addition to all your great um, TV and film work. Aaron Sorkin mm -hmm. and uh, Bartlett Share have created sort of an iconic new stage adaptation. So I feel like what Aaron Sorkin did with the text is perfect for today's audiences. A book is a book, and a film is a film, and a play is a play. Yeah. And what Aaron Sorkin has done is really made play of it. While sustaining the, the integrity of the, of the book, he managed to address issues in the play mm. that a modern, a contemporary audience would demand right. to be addressed. Uh, and without which, we would just be telling the story to get the emotional reaction we want everybody to have from To Kill a Mockingbird. So he's created a, a very faithful adaptation, but it's a new piece of work uh, entirely. And, and that, so it has its own value and its own integrity, and it's, it's just brilliantly done. You know? And of course, you know, I'm, an, I'm a text actor, so I can't wait to say those words, because he writes fabulous words. Yeah, uh, the relationship between Atticus and Scout is special. Sure Your father, is. yourself. I have many it, daughters. It, he's kind of <laughs> the uh, ultimate father figure to a lot of people. Is, yeah. that, is that special to you? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, have five, I have five daughters and two sons. The job for me is, like, you know, you can't play important, mm -hmm. you can't play historic. Those things are all great generalities that, that can be in the mind of the audience. Mm -hmm. But if you place too many obligations of that type on top of yourself as a performer, you'll never find, A, yourself in the piece, which yeah. is the only thing you have to offer. You just have to find the man who's trying to do what he thinks is the right thing under against great odds. Mm -hmm. And so if I can just find the person in there and not worry about the rest of it, yeah. then the audience will be able to have an immediate experience. And maybe instead of looking at Atticus as some sort of mythic, godlike character, you know, sort of a demigod up there, that they'll be able to find points of connection between themselves and him. Mm -hmm. Uh, just as people, so that's yeah. going to sort of be my job. You're going to look great in the suit. I can already picture it. Yeah, already the suit's pretty great. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to look great in the suit. Short, but good in the suit. <laughs> be because you've had such uh, an incredible career, audiences really feel a connection to you, and I think that I, is something that really will work for this role as you take it on the road. You, you must feel that relationship you have with audiences. I do. I love audiences. What's so exciting about, about taking this show on the road yeah which is, by the way, a great show to take across the country. It's a, a, a show that I think will elicit profound responses from people across the country. Emotional, political, all kinds of stuff. It's going to make all, it's going to make all kinds of noise. And one of the great things about having been out a couple times before is I love the specific audiences in the specific town. There are different things they find funny and, you know, you know, we didn't get that laugh in Baltimore. Well, they didn't think it was funny. They, you know what they're <laughs> like. They don't want it, but they like this. But, they, you know, the, the joy of the, of the road, if you've done it before, is that you, you, you come into a town having a feeling of the particular character and personality of that theater-going audience. Mm -hmm. And it's very exciting, you know, not to mention the gorgeous theaters that you get to play. First time I did it, I thought there's something so ancient about this process. Yeah of having a group of players together and going from city to city and bringing your play and setting it up and doing it and unpacking it and moving it on. and it's, It makes such a wonderful connection with the, the history and the story of our profession. 
We also caught up with more of the stars of the Mockingbird National Tour. I um, started in the Broadway production as a cover for Tom Robinson, and so I got to um, steal from all the great performances and sort of craft my own. It feels like an honor um, with everything that's happening um, in America and in other parts of the world. It feels like an honor to be able to tell a story of a community of people that are terrorized and how that terror transforms other communities. This story is as much about um, the, how racism transforms a white community as it is about how it destroys a black family. I love Scout Finch as a character because she, I feel like, stands for so many things and I feel like can represent so many things to a number of different people. I think that there is a sense of innocence uh, throughout the play and throughout the book with Scout that I feel lucky to embody every single night. The show is so rooted in physicality, especially for the kids. We have to be able to embody nine-year-old, for me a nine-year-old, and for Jim uh, a little bit older. You know, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a very welcomed challenge. What excites me about it is um, I know a lot of people that will come um, have, some of them, a lifelong relationship with the book or with the movie. For those who might be younger, who uh, haven't read the book yet, who, you know, haven't seen the film, you know, they're really gonna be in for a wonderful, needed, necessary uh, evening at the theater. As a country, as a society, as a world, uh, part of me wishes we didn't need this story as much as we do. Everyone will be coming in from whatever walk of life they come in with. I don't think it's possible to experience this story, this play, this evening, and not feel something. This is a Broadway show and we're back in just a few. Help is on the way, dear. That's because Mrs. Doubtfire is now on Broadway. We met up with Elena Waters, one of the show's great performers at Open Jar Studios, to find out why she's just got to dance. Hi, I'm Elena Waters, and I am part of the ensemble and the flamenco dancer and singer in Mrs. Doubtfire. I started dancing when I was six, almost seven. We had moved from England, where I fell in love with musical theater, my dad was in the Air Force, to Colorado, where he retired. And so that's where I began dancing. Ballet, jazz, tap, all of those basics. And so from six, almost seven on, began my journey. My first time on stage. I have a vague memory of being a frog for some kind of Mother's Day tea performance in England. And then in third grade, I got to be Little Red Riding Hood. And so that was at Sunrise Ridge Elementary School in Colorado Springs. And so I remember getting to shine as Little Red. Since falling in love with musical theater in London, before I really understood what Broadway was, I knew I wanted to do that. There was a brief moment when I thought about being a veterinarian, but I'm allergic to pretty much all animals and I fainted in the vet's office. But mostly I really, I love to sing, dance, tell stories, and started teaching dance when I was 16. And I went to school for musical theater. I knew that that's what I'm meant to do. And I'm so grateful that I get to be one of those people living my dreams. My Broadway debut was a little strange because I had to agree to a week-to-week -week contract. I made my Broadway debut as the Anita Standby in West Side Story and somebody was injured so they had a swing in and then they needed coverage for Anita. So I came in, I learned the show in a week. You know, I didn't have a dressing room. I was sitting outside of the stage management office like waving to people, hi. We got through opening and then sometime after opening, um, one of the women, she came back. They did eventually ask me to come back and replace her, but they wouldn't put it in writing. And since I had already gotten an offer for the Adams Family, I chose to go and get to be a part of my first original musical, which actually felt, Adams Family felt like my Broadway debut. It's actually really amusing to me now because I remember Sergio Trujillo coming up and asking me, do you do flamenco? I was like, no. And now to actually be the flamenco singer-dancer in Mrs. Doubtfire is like, oh cool. It was just like an, an unknown foreshadowing for my future career. To be dancing in Mrs. Doubtfire right now after such a long, arduous pandemic period, what a gift 
to get to be a part of joy spreading, which is my personal mission in life, I'm really grateful. I think that my younger self would be really excited that I'm living the dream of being a Broadway performer, triple threat singer, dancer, actor. I'd be really proud of myself. I am. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.